All right. All right. Well, here we are sitting down with Michael from Othram. Michael, how's it going? It's going very well, thank you. How you doing? I'm doing really great. Good, Thanks. good. So tell me, what did you bring here with you today, or to the Ishi 32? What did you bring with you to showcase? What are you telling me? So uh, with Othram, we're really big on looking at all un unsolved crimes, okay. unsolved, uh, unidentified human remains. There's hundreds of thousands of these cases out there. Yeah. A lot of them have very difficult, challenging forensic evidence, uh, very low quantities of DNA, highly degraded, highly contaminated. And uh, we've built some really cool methods and technology on top of forensic platforms to analyze that, those pieces of evidence and actually extract information that's useful to create DNA profiles, okay. which can then be used to do uh, genealogy, target testing, things of that nature. And so without having that really clear profile to distinguish true markers and relationships, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to go any further. And so our, our big thing is creating the very best uh, DNA profile from which to work from. So are people sending you these samples? Like yes. they're in your database or something, they call you up, they're like, hey, we have these remains, we found them in a forest, whatever. Right. We have no way to identify them. Are they sending them to you or does it go to a crime lab or somewhere else first? Great question. So yeah. both, both okay. actually. So in some cases, uh, if it's unidentified human remains, they may send them directly to us okay. because we have some really cool human enrichment methods for bones okay. to basically take out all the heavy contaminants and degradation mm -hmm. from bone and get the useful human component to bubble up, which okay. is that's what we want to work from when we sequence it. Um, but then we also have a lot of cases, particularly criminal cases, right? Yep. Where um, maybe there's an unknown profile from a crime scene that was found on blood on a shirt or semen on pants or whatever it may be. Okay. That's sent to the crime lab. The crime lab does their great thing of extracting the DNA, quantifying it, putting it in a little tube, uh, figuring out if there's a mixture or not. And then they'll send that extraction to us and we'll work from it. So we can go both ways. Generally speaking though, uh, if it's a, a crime, the crime lab is generally involved okay. on the front end and they'll develop a, a CODIS profile, upload it to CODIS, see if they can get a hit. If they can't, they'll flip it to us and we'll help from there. Okay, so you're not specifically working with CODIS, but you're working with how many other That's right, so we don't do any CODIS and... testing. So, okay. so we don't do any STR okay. or CODIS okay. testing. So CODIS will look at uh, about 20 markers of DNA, and that'll confirm parent-child sure. or sibling relationship. Uh, we're analyzing tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of markers of DNA. So we're ac accessing a ton more evidence, and the reason you want to do that is so you can build these very detailed profiles. And with that detailed profile, you can really tell relationships when you start uploading to databases, GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA. We have our own called DNA Solves, dnasolves.com. People can check that out oh, okay. if they want to upload their DNA and share. Um, and so, yeah, we, we just focus on building those profiles from whatever evidence comes to us, be it original evidence or extractions, and then we go from there. Oh, wow, that's, that's incredible. You know, I, I've had this thought in my head about how, how are people they seem very willing to give up their own DNA. And when that goes into your hands, you know, how do they ensure that that's not gonna be, you know, used in some strange way or you sure. know, like that? I, I feel like people are very easily giving that yeah. data to people. Yeah, I think if people are comfortable doing it, uh, that they, they should look into it and yeah. see, you know, what database they're uploading to and if it makes sense for them. Um, our DNA solves database is used strictly for law enforcement cases, okay. hum, unidentified human remains or, or trying to help find perpetrators of crime, reconnecting lost people to families. Um, and ours is completely uh, you know, protected and the privacy policy is all over it. We have yeah. some very crazy human encryption used by like the Secret Service and things like that. Um, but people should check it out you know, yes. and make sure they're comfortable doing it. And then uh, if they are, it really does help in terms of sorting out uh, family trees and including and excluding potential relatives of a DNA source. Yep. Okay, now tell me, Michael, do you ever get to see the end product of what you've done, right? So if you're working on a case and you're working with law enforcement, there's probably some things you can't find out, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but do you ever get to find out what happened in the end to yeah. these cases? Yes, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's the most rewarding part of the job yeah. is, is to see it come full circle and um, you know, whether it's reconnecting a, a Jane John or, or Baby Doe in a lot of cases back to distant family that mm -hmm. maybe they thought they just ran away or, or you know, that they never reported missing or, you know, there's people just kind of disappear sometimes and, and no one knows to really look for them or where to look for them. 
Um, so being able to, you know, see family one get reconnected mm -hmm. or get closure if, if something happened to a loved one of theirs and they didn't know who did it, um, you know, that, that's a big piece. And then seeing the uh, investigators, a lot of these investigators spend sometimes a lifetime yeah. working these cases, um, decades, years, and they pour a lot of their heart and soul to it. They get connected, they're working with the family. And so to see it all come to full fruition, is it, it's great. And it just shows um, kind of this direction that we're going in, in terms of forensics and law enforcement. You have all these components of uh, good detective work, mm -hmm. good science and technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then people just, the general population are helping out. You know, there's a lot of cases on our dnasolves.com platform, uh, there's a lot of agencies that don't have uh, dollars earmarked for advanced DNA testing. There's small rural agencies, for example. And um, if we look at those cases and we'll do a review of the evidence and see if it's tractable that we think we can help, we'll say, hey, let us crowdfund it. There's a lot of people out there that follow work we do. Um, we'll throw it on dnasolves.com, we'll share it on podcasts, we'll, uh, we'll share it in local media where the crime or the unidentified person was found. Um, and we'll help raise money that way. And, uh, and we've been very successful in doing that as well. And I think ultimately there's gonna be more state and federal funds that will be applied to this advanced DNA testing, but it's so new right now um, that you know, it takes a while for government to sometimes catch yep. up with the testing yep. that's going on. To really see what the benefit of it is, right? That's right. Um, wow, that's incredible. Um, do you ever think about the people that you have helped? I mean, how does that make you feel when you know that the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis are helping people. Yeah, it's it's great. You know, um, generally we don't we don't have much communication with sure. family. We're, we're we're interfacing directly with law enforcement or a medical yeah. examiner or a coroner, for example. Um, but we have had cases where um, you know there was a, a 1974 murder of Carla Walker, sexual assault murder of Carla Walker, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, the capital murder trial was actually just a couple of weeks ago in which our lab director had to testify in. Oh my gosh. Uh, the okay. defense was trying to get our work to be not admissible. Uh, sure. Well, it's kind of a landmark case for forensic genetic genealogy because the judge decided to keep it in um, after our testimony. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was a big case. And in that case, we ended up meeting uh, a lot of Carla's friends from high school and her brother. And um, uh, we, we spent a, a weekend in Austin at CrimeCon together at that convention. Okay. And um, it, it was very impactful because the brother, this has weighed on him for, for many, many years, as you can imagine. Uh, he said his parents were never the same after that. Um, and, and then she had a boyfriend that was with him at the time of the crime. You know, they were in a car at a Valentine's dance outside a bowling alley, um, you know, making out, doing what high school kids do. And some guy came, opened the door, pistol whipped the boyfriend, took Carla. Um, but there was a cloud of suspicion over this boyfriend for 46 oh, oh, years. Yeah, how could there not be? Right? Yeah, right? He was the only one there. It was his story, his word. Yeah. And so, um, you know, to, to talk with him and then to see him kind of have this, you know, because he never was, you know, indicted or anything like that, right. but there's a cloud of suspicion over yeah. him the whole time. You and live so, in that town, you're probably going to be, oh, there's that guy. That's right. And there's yeah. the ripple effect, right? The yeah. whole community is affected. So yeah. to see that, even after 46 years, kind of get alleviated and, and you know Carla you know now that this case allowed this type of advanced testing you know there's there's some silver lining to take out of this horrible situation that perhaps this can now be applied to cases going forward yeah that's incredible that's a good story mm -hmm. um, did you do a video series right yes author did you did it what was that called? Oh man, uh, it put me on the, the spot. Missing, the, the missing piece. The missing piece. Yeah, yes. the missing piece with issue. Yes. Yeah, that was Othram and working through that. Whole that's process, right. That's right. Yep. I yeah, think we've uh, they've released three or four now. Yeah. I think. Um, and we have several more in the works. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I like that. You know, it seems like Othram is taking social media and using that as well. I mean, if you're doing crowdfunding and you're using social media in a very positive way right that's that's forward thinking and incredible as well well, well there's a funny thing to add there is uh it's not funny it's great okay so when we have these cases that we announce that we're going to start working and, and as i mentioned with dna solves where we crowdfund some of these cases um, folks can also go on and upload their data if they're so comfortable uh, they can help fund it and they can share right we have yeah. very easy links for twitter facebook I don't know what else is up there. I think that's all Snapchat. I know. Snapchat. Yeah, who that's knows? Who I knows? It's a good one. Snapchat. Filters, you know? Right. Um, but people can share it there. And we actually yeah. had a case out in North Dakota, um, funny enough, where my grandparents are from. 
it was an unidentified John Doe, and okay. um, we were going to start working the case with the sheriff's office there. And we put out a story, they put out a press release on their end in Williston, okay. and people started clicking and sharing, right? And before we even got uh, the, the unidentified remains sent to us, a cousin of this missing person saw it and, and thought, hey, based on the tattoo explanation, this could be my cousin that I haven't seen in 30 years. And sure enough, it what? was. So it got solved just by the, the, the crowd and citizens sharing a story that, that we were gonna start working with the sheriff's office. So a lot of good can come out of that. Yeah. And so whether it's you know us being able to fund it and apply the technology or people sharing it, getting more eyes on it, there's a lot of ways these cases can be solved. Yeah, that's impressive. That's really great. Well, this is no issue number what for you guys? Um, for me personally, it's number one. Oh, first okay. of many. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great We're time. a pretty young company. You know, we okay. built built in 2018, launched oh. early 2019. Oh, right during a pandemic. Right. Yeah. It's yeah, perfect wow. timing. Right. That's Plan fantastic. that right. Yeah. Um, but I think we are at to 2019, and of course, okay. last year virtually. So yeah. um, excited to be here this year in person. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you, and hopefully we'll see you next year. Yeah. Issue 33 in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. So we'll be there. All right. Well, thanks a lot for stopping by and you talking, bet. Michael. Of course. Take it easy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Take care.